Welcome to The Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. With your hosts, Dan Green and Eric Stewart. Well, I'm excited to finally be having this conversation. I am as well. <laughs> We've talked about doing this for a while. Yeah, definitely. We've talked about doing a lot of things for a while, but we actually are getting things done. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, getting things done, actually, yeah, that's, you know, um, a relevant part of being creative, actually accomplishing things. I agree. As opposed to just thinking about doing things. So we decided that this uh, first episode should be titled The Call to Adventure because it's similar to the experience I think that everybody has when they are creative, when they have inspirations. They want to fulfill them in some way. They want to bring them to some sort of completion. And The Call to Adventure is a term that Joseph Campbell popularized many decades ago. He analyzed various myths and religious traditions from around the world. He taught at Sarah Lawrence. He was a big inspiration to George Lucas. And a lot of scholars refer to his work when talking about the the hero's journey, which is 17 or so steps that are observed in many myths around the world. Well, the call to adventure is one of the early ones, and it's what gets the hero going on their adventure. And to many of our listeners, you are a hero to them. You live a creative life. You live as an artist. And part of the way that we're going to talk about things is framing it in terms of this hero's adventure. It applies to every life or anything that you want to do. So what would you say were some of your early calls to adventure? Or perhaps what was the most relevant one, do you think? Well, first of all, I think that it's a, that's a, it's a great template that you've chosen as our uh, roadmap to explaining some of these things to our listeners. Um, you know, for me, I grew up in a creative environment with my mother being a dancer and a professor of dance. And so I was always exposed to the performing side. And as a little kid, I, I spent a lot of time uh, actually in the studio as a, as a baby watching my mother teach these classes and watching people with movement and performance. And I kind of enjoyed that as a kid. I, I think my mother told me when I, was, um, when I was a little baby, I would stand up and give speeches <laughs> in nonsense to anyone who would listen to me in well, the and, house. And you and haven't entirely outgrown that, things which like is that. nice. So I think from an early... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sometimes people understand what I'm saying. Most of the time, not. Um, uh, as long as I get hired. Um, but it was it was interesting because I used humor a lot as a younger person, and I still do, but mostly as, in my youth because I was kind of shy, and I felt that uh, if I could mm. get people to like me by making them laugh, then uh, maybe I would make friends, uh, right. especially because I had switched schools at a very awkward age of, of fifth grade, which was, uh, you know, I was a new kid in my school. So to be funny was my 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 weapon of choice. Yeah, but I just wanted to circle back to, to you talking, uh, you know, not giving nonsense speeches, you know, when you were young. Was that partly, be I mean, because you were seeing your mom teach? And you were sort of mimicking the, I'm going to tell you, you know, what to listen to. Yeah, I think that I found that that was just part of life. Like growing up with that as part of what my mother did, I figured then I could give my speeches. Or, But in terms of the performing side or that call to action to take that leap, I remember very early, early on, I, I went to a, um, a very cool kind of crunchy, hippy-dippy sleepaway camp when I was younger. And you could do anything you wanted. It was modeled after the English boarding school school, Summerhill, actually spelled S-O-M-E-R, uh, where you planned your own schedule. The counselors would come in the morning and say, uh, you had five periods during the day, and they would say, I'm going to be teaching tennis for five periods. Or someone would say, I'm going to be doing arts and crafts for period one and two, or, or I'm going to be doing music from this and whatever. And you could plan your own schedule instead of being told what to do. So there was some structure, but you had a lot of freedom. Right. And so I wanted to hang out in the music shack. Mm -hmm. I didn't really play guitar. I was not confident to sing. Uh, I was, you know, we're talking like 10 years old, but I wanted to be around music. I wanted to be around the arts. And a friend of mine was much more uh, accomplished as a guitar player. He had a swagger about him, uh, but he couldn't sing. And there was a talent show and he said, Hey, do you think you could sing this uh, Jimi Hendrix song, Purple Haze, while I played guitar and showed off my chops? And I was like, I don't sing. And he's like, yeah, but I think you could do it. And I was like, all right. And so we rehearsed it. Mm. I got up and did this song with him. 
Now, I was nervous. You know, this is not my comfort level at all. But those are the moments when you do something that's that scary and then you feel the energy from the audience, whether they cheer for you, they clap, whatever it is, that positive reinforcement of, hey, good job. Mm -hmm. That's the drug. That was the moment that I said, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I'm going to be a, an actor, a musician, an, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's going to involve live performance mm -hmm. because I love that risk right. and that reward. Right. That was it for me. Um, and how about you? I mean, what you have done beyond the voice acting mm -hmm. stuff, you've done a lot of stage performances and, and gone to school for acting. Was there a moment for you that was that, that click that said, you know what, this is what I want to do? Yeah, I think that I, that's true of a lot of people who have more than one creative outlet. You have different sorts of pulls or, you know, calls to adventure at different times in different ways. When I was younger, like yourself, part of how I socialized was through humor because I felt very awkward. And But I became adept enough at being able to be funny in a certain way. But I think what I was, I put more pride in and what I was more recognized for when I was in elementary school was um, I could draw better than, than most of the other kids. And my mom drew uh, and she taught me what she knew. Mm -hmm. And one of my best birthday presents ever. I received this illustration. It was like 16 by 9. It was an illustration of the superhero, The Vision, who we've recently seen in Avengers. But so I was like, oh, wow, this is a great picture. But the better part of the present was it was by a local comic book artist who my mom had arranged to give me drawing lessons because she knew I was way into comics. So the idea that I would be good enough at something that my mom thought that I should get lessons at, it, you know, made me feel special. Yeah. It wasn't long after taking those lessons that I also was thinking about character and stories and stuff like that. I got into acting in high school, again, through sort of a lack of, of, of fitting in anywhere else. And I had moved from Indiana to New Jersey and I'd been going through a huge depression, but there were, they were auditioning for these plays and these one-act plays that were you know, humor-oriented. I believe it was uh, a play called Lovers and Other Strangers. There's vignettes of various couples. Anyway, so when I saw the audition process, I was like, I, I think I could do that. And I was a huge fan of comedy in general, Steve Martin in particular as a stand-up comedian. A lot of our listeners may not know that he was a comedian before he became a, a film personality. But I also just love comedy in general. I'd grown up on MASH and you know, <laughs> I Dream of Genie and <laughs> Gilligan's Island and all these things. And, you know, Very broad uh, humor, Three's Company. I thought Jack Ritter was amazing, you know. <laughs> he was, though. He really was. He was. He was. Uh, Mork and Mindy, Robin Williams. I mean, that was huge. Um, Henry Winkler, the Fonz, too. He just won an Emmy Award. But um, in, in high school, it was more when the acting thing came in. And fortunately, I got into a good school for acting. But, um, but I think part of that, the humor thing like you had when you were a kid, that relationship to an audience, the live relationship to an audience, yes. um, is, is very infectious. Y yes. Right? Yeah, I loved doing stage work. I did a couple of really bad independent films and appeared on a number of soap operas like day player roles where you have, you know, a little scene. Any actor will tell you that the stage is really more the environment for the actor because they're basically, you know, the heart of the show. Sure. Right. But in terms of this um, mythic journey that <laughs> you can sort of template onto any person's life, there's the call to adventure, but very often there's the refusal of the call. That's actually one of the steps. So like there's this tug, hey, maybe you should do this whatever that may be. But then there's a resistance to that. Some of that resistance comes from environmental things. So I can't because I have an application to this or that, or there are internal things. I don't think I'm good enough. Right. Talk a little bit about that for yourself. I always felt because of the support that I had, even though my mother was in the arts, my father wasn't. My father was a defense attorney. And uh, actually, one of the things that he had said to me when I decided that this is what I wanted to do. And I, the only things that stood in my way were, okay, how am I going to do what I want to do when I want to do it? Mm. Well, I'm going to have to figure out a way to pay bills. And, you know, I, I took every job possible to allow me to pursue what I wanted to do. So whether it was cleaning pools or doing landscaping or construction or even the, the choice of working in voice overs was also pretty much a, a, a fluke obviously you can tell by my career but um but <laughs> but but it was interesting because my father unlike my mother who had experienced the creative world she was more afraid of my decisions 
So the the only mm. pushback I got because she knew she knew what the likelihoods were in terms of having a sustainable career. Exactly, and the and just too many starving artists, all of this sort of stuff. And so she was a little bit more uh, afraid of these things, though very supportive, but was still mm-hmm. more of like, okay, you know, uh, you need to go to school, you need to do this, you need to get a job. <laughs> and, yeah. and my father was, you know, if he doesn't call home and ask for money, he's not in jail and he's not doing anything illegal. Well, he works hard at what he does, so I'll support him in what he's what, what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. As an independent production company, Andromeda greatly benefits from the support of its audience. If you're able to contribute as little as a dollar a month, consider going to our Patreon page. Any support you can give means a lot to us creators, and we're excited to bring you more. Visit AndromedaProductions.com and see what's in store. If this is content you enjoy, please like, subscribe, and share on YouTube. I never really had the question mark of, should I be doing this and it holding me back? My issue was, what am I going to do? I got a very nice compliment from a dear friend of mine who repeated the same compliment as I spoke to him yesterday on the phone. He said, you know, we always thought of you as a renaissance man, Eric. And I was like, well, that's very flattering. He said, no, because you do so many things and you do them well. And I'm not saying that to, to pat myself on the back, but I have been someone who, if I want to learn how to do something, I immerse myself in it. I can easily believe that. To a degree that becomes a little bit almost too intense um, when I wanted to learn how to engineer and learn Pro Tools. I sat and watched videos and and I would try to sit in on sessions and watch people that were you know expert in this field just to absorb like a sponge. So mm-hmm. so for me there wasn't the the pushback, but it was more of like okay where do I fit? Mm-hmm. Where can I use these abilities in something that can also not only bring me joy but maybe. I can actually earn a living. That specific example you just gave reminds me of something else that Joseph Campbell talks about, where if you follow the path you're supposed to be on, one of the phrases he uses, follow your bliss, the thing that you know really brings you joy. But if you do that, you very often find yourself in situations where there are these helping hands, these other you know ways to elevate uh, you or to help you get to where you want to be, you wanting to be an engineer was something that you were exposed to because of the environment that you already got yourself into right. following what you wanted to do and putting you in a position to, to be able to learn that better than most people might have available to them. So that's great. Yeah. And I think for me, it was when I finally realized that voice acting, being on that side of the glass, mm. um, instead of being sort of you know on the stage or singing or whatever, um, right. was a way that I could use some skills and also potentially earn a living, mm-hmm. which would give me the freedom to do the things that I truly love. So the pushback wasn't there, um, but it was more of like, what do I do with this sort of bag of tricks? Where, <laughs> well, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> what does this, <laughs> what's this recipe? Growing up in a family with, with a creative person, same as you, I'm wondering like your mom, obviously, did she draw for a living? No, no. So that was um, for her a hobby. And my mother uh, worked at Purdue University in their alumni department and then later at Rutgers University, the first woman, actually, to uh, run the alumni department at Rutgers University. Wow. Yeah, in in between jobs, she got a PhD in communications while raising four kids in the 70s after my father died in 1974. Oh, so she was a slacker. She she was totally a slacker, (laughs) totally irresponsible and impractical. No, but she was, if you wanted anything done, my God, my mom uh, would get it done. And she was, she was, I mentioned that (laughs) birthday where I got that, you know, illustration in the lessons. Another thing that my mom was known for was making these fantastic birthday cakes. So, like, she, because she had drawing skills, she could create an image and icing. You know, for, so for me, she like did the face of vision based on the illustration that she got. Wow! There was one we, we got. This was when I was very, very young. The, the house I grew up in had an indoor pool. Ooh. And so that year, mom made a cake where the outside of the cake was, you know, cake, and she made it look like the tiling around the pool. The inside of the cake was blue jello. Wow. <laughs> Wow. A creative, a creative. So, mind. so she was creative, um, but ve- but very structured, very practical. But but she was always she was always supportive of the acting stuff that I did. And to put that question on to me, yeah, my obstacles were mostly self imposed. Mm-hmm. But I was also going through huge depression from like ten. I started started around ten years old or so. 
So when it came time for me to uh, graduate high school, which I didn't do, I, I had to retake one year because I was so depressed and I was institutionalized, which was one of the best things ever that happened to me. That's a whole other story. Right. I self-admitted uh, into the facility. But um, when it came time to what do I do for college, for me, it was a very, very clear answer because... Doing the acting stuff, going on stage, and I had also, you know, done, you know, videos and shot little movies and whatever that you do on the high school level when video cameras are available to you. Right. And, uh, and I, you know, I had movie ideas and, and stuff like that. But it was clear to me that acting was the thing that I actually got my ass in gear for. You know, that's what I actually showed up to do. I would blow off mountains of homework, but I would make sure I knew all my lines. Right. Because I would not let down the people I was on stage with. I had that kind of communal uh, sense of responsibility. I can mess up my own life, right? but I'm not going to put anybody else in jeopardy, right? And that carried me through a long way, actually. You're talking about the roadblocks that, that were there for you yeah. as, as personal uh, choices, but yet did you feel that your, your need to not let down your team was the thing that pulled you through those things, got you through those things? I do. I do. I think relating to something outside myself helped me get out of the quagmire of myself. There was something bigger than me, right? Right. And that really helped a lot. And when you're at that age of adolescence, which lasts several years, maybe I'll finally get out of my, yeah. <laughs> which has lasted several right. decades. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's inescapably a self-absorbed age. There's so much going on with you. And you're really having to to account for a lot, to withstand a lot. Yeah. And having something that was clearly outside myself and, and a positive thing uh, helped enormously. Speaking of outside yourself. Uh, yes. I think we should check in with our wizard friend. Oh, our wizard friend, of course. Yes. Outside yourself and, and also a, a positive influence. Let's check him out. Welcome to Wizardly Words of Wisdom. I am your host, Tips and Tricks, and you are my guest, uh, listener, audience, victim? No, uh, well, I don't know about that, but I do know a few things about making your dreams come true. First, define your goal. You may want a better life, but what does that mean? A new job? A better place to live? A different spouse? Who knows? It's up to you to define, and once you do, you'll be that much closer to getting to where you want to be. Number two, make a plan. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, it's different than what you're already doing, so you have to do something different to do it. Maybe make an hour every day devoted to that task, to that dream, to that goal. And speaking of time, that brings me to number three, make a deadline. It provides a tangible goal and makes you more mindful of your time, which is helpful to be, to be. And number three, or, or is this four? Well, never mind, I'll say it anyway just because I like you. Pat yourself on the back. A little well-earned positivity for things that you've actually accomplished goes a long way to help keep you motivated, and that helps to get you to where you want to go. Well, that's all I can think of at the moment. I'll look forward to the next time I can share some wizardly words of wisdom. Well, once again, the wizard has some great advice, especially uh, how to make your dreams come true, you know? Which is what we all want to do, right? Mm, well, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> but uh, you just indulged me in talking about the difficulties that I was having and then things that I found that helped get me through that. But but uh, you, know, you tell me your angle on that. So so what was going on with you? For me, from what I was saying before, my childhood was not ideal. Uh, you know, my father uh, left my mother when I was four and mm -hmm. I was a very angry young man. Sure. And so a lot of my energy went to uh, for the wrong sort of purposes. I mean, I I'm not proud to say, but I and I, I got in a lot of fights as a kid um, because I didn't know how to harness that energy and that and that anger. And so for me, 
the comedy, the performance, this and that. It was like, okay, uh, you have a choice, Eric. You can either keep getting in trouble or you can take this and use it for something that might be a, a good thing. I think that if I didn't grow up in such an open sort of uh, family of uh, as long as you work hard, you can do anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. If I didn't grow up in that situation, added on top of the anger issues that I had, it would have been a completely different path that I would have taken. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank goodness for that. And I think my mother recognized that she had her hands full of uh, being a single parent for, for at least the first 10 years of my life before she remarried, that what am I going to do with this young boy that's obviously got some, you know, some anger issues, and but is also, he's, he's obviously very creative. He's very talented. He's, he's got something he wants to say, um, obviously, from the standing up as a baby and giving speeches. But, um, yeah, it's it's and I think that a lot of people think that uh, there's only sort of one path. Right. Um, and, and there really and there really isn't. Yeah. Because yeah. I would never have said to you that, you know, I'm about to turn uh, 52 in October. I would never have said to you that at 51, um, this would be my career path. Mm hmm. Now there are pieces of it that I would have said, yeah, I, I play music and I and I act and I you know whatever it is and I engineer. These are things that I was interested in as a young man, but I would never have said to you this was the path. Mm -hmm. um, what you also have to do as an artist, an actor, or whatever you are, is you look at this this as I called it before my bag of tricks. You look at your bag of tricks and you say, well. How do these things fit together to help each other, one another? Or, or mm -hmm. how can I mm -hmm. tie them together? I mean, first of all, doing these uh, convention appearances, I perform my music concerts. Right. And my anime fans have become my music fans. And I get to share more of my life with them and who I am than I would have expected. But I would never have said to you, I'm going to be playing rock and roll shows at anime conventions. And, this, and I'm going to travel yeah. around the world to do it. Right. 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 I, when I first told my rock pals that this was something I was doing, they're like, what are you doing playing those things? And I'm like, these are the most loyal fans in the world. And <laughs> when was the last time you got to go play in Australia? Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 It, it's like it's just it's you, you never know what that path is going to be. And if it doesn't work out the way you try to make this plan, that's OK, too. That's an excellent point. You're so right. And, you know, speaking of plans, let's plan to bring this part of episode one to a close. I like when a plan comes together. <laughs> and, of course, we'll have part two of episode one coming up next week, right? Yep. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. See you then. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Adromeda Productions, we wish you well. Adromeda, always a sound choice. <laughs>